my job today is to talk about the intersection or the interface between research, clinical care, and actually education in our academic medical centers, of which Children's Hospital of Philadelphia is, is, is one. Um, I will add that I was, uh, the, the MOMS trial, I spent a fair amount of time, I was on the uh, safety, one of the safety committees for that trial. Um, one, thing we, one part of this research is that we always have safety and data monitoring uh, organizations that look carefully at all of the uh, inter interval points as these studies are being done to make sure that uh, there's not untoward effects going on. So I was uh, honored to be part of that group. Uh, we have the real thing later, and so I'm going to talk only real, give you a very abbreviated story that I'd like to start with is Paloma's story. And uh, Paloma was born oh, around I guess 20 years ago now, and uh, I think we'll see that what happened with her uh, was not happening, as Dr. Kubacher said, uh, 20 years before that in say the 60s and 70s, simply not happening. Uh, she was born at 26 weeks. She weighed about a pound and a half. Spent three or three and a half months in our newborn intensive care unit. A number of other complications of prematurity. And uh, you know, we do keep in touch with a lot of our, uh, what we call the NICU graduates for a few years. But then we often lose touch as they go on with their lives and families move, et cetera. Uh, my colleague, though, recently took her daughter to, uh, to Harvard as an undergraduate and was in this room full of uh, families. He's saying goodbye to their children, having um, uh, a sort of social hour uh, before the uh, freshman year started. And up comes. Paloma's mother to my colleague and said, Doctor, Dr. Abbasi, you remember Paloma? And, and there she was, you know, 18, 17 years later, having been a tiny one and a half pound baby as a Harvard freshman. Now, it's not always that rosy, but the point is we have a lot of successes that go on uh, over the last 20, 30 years that simply weren't possible without research, is what we'll, we'll get to. But, you know, tiny babies, this, this baby in this picture is um, around a 25 week gestation baby, probably. and. Um, you see tubes, lines, all sorts of support, life support going on. And we're not going to go into all sort of detail, but basically these small babies are at risk for uh, uh, disease and eventual, sometimes even damage, and long-term problems in almost every system, the brain, uh, the heart, the lungs, uh, the blood system, uh, gastrointestinal system. So everything is underdeveloped, and a lot of our goal in the NICU is to support those systems until the babies can survive and, and uh, mature and grow up on their own. Next. So part of, part of the message today is about you know, how things have changed. And you know, if you go back into the 60s and 70s, uh, for small babies, these are babies really under 28 weeks and under. So that's three to four plus months early before a 40 week gestation term due date. Uh, back in the, the earlier days, at most 15, 20% of the babies in this category survived. And now, uh, over the last uh, 20, 30 years, we're now reached a point where over 75% of the babies in this group survive. And when you're at the 26th week and beyond, it, our modern survival statistics are typically around uh, 90%. So it's been a, a real uh, up, up wheel, up, uh, sorry, uphill battle, but here we are. Um, but the point being, there's still challenges ahead. Uh, 23, 24 week babies still uh, struggle mightily. Uh, and beyond that, uh, we're, we're doing much, much better. Next. So you know, how did we get here? And, Basically, it's my message is that the newborn intensive care unit research does impact lives. It saves lives, it improves outcomes. And I think there's little doubt about that now. And Dr. Gumacher mentioned uh, a, few, a few of these trials. And you know, again, I had a lot, I started with a list of about 20 or 30, and uh, we don't have all day, so I coded it down a little bit. <laughs> One or two were already mentioned. Uh, progesterone for prevention of preterm labor, already uh, discussed. But I did want to spend a minute on, on the first one up there, which is the NICHD Neonatal Research Network similar to the MFM, the Maternal Fetal Medicine Network that was already mentioned. Uh, this is a consortium funded by NICHD, 18 NICUs across the country participate. And um, we agree when we go into these networks to actually do the hard work that needs to be done. Uh, it's a long process about the collaboratives, what research should be done, how are we going to do it, how to vet the protocols, and translating that all the way down to the bedside, which I'll get to in a minute. But it's a key part of uh, our mission, and really, we could not advance uh, the field without it. Antenatal corticosteroids, uh, giving mothers a steroid shot before birth, is a great example of how the NIH has brought that convener process together and consensus statements and working on getting implementation. The original research for that uh, showed improvement in premature babies' outcomes, uh, RDS, uh, death, and um, brain bleeding. 
was done quite a long time ago, but it was slow to be uh, adopted in the obstetric community for a variety of reasons. So uh, at one point, actually two points, <laughs> the NIH convened, again, all the experts together to put up very strong statements that this is a treatment that really works needs to be done. And after, I think, the second one, I think the usage of that uh, treatment uh, before birth rose from somewhere around 60% across the country to, to 90% today. Um, CPAP, that's distending pressure through a respirator or a nasal device to help the baby's uh, lungs expand, uh, was very key. And again, CPAP alone we, you know, would have likely saved uh, Dr., uh, Dr. Uh, President Kennedy's child, uh, but that was not available at the time. Uh, surfactant, which is a, uh, a sort of detergent-like substance that's made in our lungs, not made in the premature baby's lungs, that causes their lungs to collapse. It's called respiratory distress syndrome. We now have replacement uh, treatments for that that were a, a big point of research. And I'll mention those again in a second. Uh, NIH has been very active in funding uh, treatments and preventions for retinopathy of prematurity. Retinopathy, or ROP as we call it, is a scarring condition where uh, premature babies' eyes get exposed to, uh, actually disposed to preterm birth and can have scarring conditions that can lead to blindness. Uh, you know, we now have treatments that have reduced the incidence of blindness from you know, several percent of all these small babies down to less than one percent. And that's been a, a big plus. And along the way, uh, another study that was actually in some ways a negative study, but also showed us something we should not be doing, uh, the NICHD Neonate ne Research Network over the past uh, four or five years did a large study called the SUPPORT trial, which uh, we won't get into the controversy that followed all this. However, what that trial did show us is that we thought that lowering oxygen levels in the preemie babies would help prevent retinopathy, which it actually does. Um, but there were side effects that we were not uh, aware of ahead of time. And so it helped us really fine tune our trial of oxygen therapy to try to find the right balance between uh, improving eyesight and, uh, and saving lives. The uh, NRN, the Mean Research Network, also has a, a, a database. So it's not just the babies, the small babies who are in a research trial, but really all the babies born in our, uh, all the preemie babies born in our network hospitals have a reporting system, and the NRN has a very large database of a uh, host of outcomes and antecedents, all the treatments that are received and so forth. It's a very rich database for us to explore, uh, because one of the, our other messages is that after the babies get through intensive care, we have to know how they do in the long run. It's no longer sufficient to say, oh, made it home. How are we doing two years, five years, uh, 15 years uh, later? And the uh, follow-up programs as piloted by NIH and others are key to that. We'll skip progesterone, clear it out. So here's a little diagram I put together about, again, this interface. Um, we've heard about the big trials. What actually happens? What happens in the NICU? How do we actually uh, get the uh, answers and the plans down to the unit and after the trials are done, what happens? So you just start on the upper left corner there, you know, basic science research. Um, again, the progesterone is not a bad example. You know, steroid biology, how does uh, premature labor start? How does the uh, uterine muscle uh, cells respond to progesterone or other steroids is done first. Then translational research, where we're taking those original discoveries and trying to work through animal models or other applications to ready them for a clinical research uh, trial, in this case in, in, in the NICU, and, and once they we're through that process and there's been a, a very lengthy time frame of uh, preparation, we're actually able to study the various treatments in, in babies under very controlled conditions. When that research is done, uh, either leads to FDA approval, for instance, if it happens to be a drug treatment, or in other cases where it's really a, a method or an approach, uh, a clinical guideline of some sort often from the NIH or other professional organizations that said, okay, we've now studied this. We know within reason what the oxygen level should be in premature babies. Uh, you know, let's, let's do it. But it doesn't stop there. We actually have to, whole teams of people work on clinical implementation. It's been shown that unfortunately, it sometimes takes many years before all clinicians adopt new, new scientific discoveries. And so we now back up the clinical implementation with quality improvement teams that take these new uh, discoveries and then we find ways of working within our systems with the doctors and nurses and, uh, and others to get those implemented. And then there's a back end of research called clinical effectiveness research, 
which actually says, okay, here's this treatment, now we're using it, what's happening next? What's happening in real life, not just the laboratory or the study, what's happening in real life? Are we continuing to improve outcomes? Are we continuing to save costs? And then the longitudinal outcomes research in the bottom left is what I mentioned is that we do uh, to really follow these babies in the long run and, and see how they do. And then the loop gets closed, a lot of arrows there, you can just look at all the arrows, they go back and forth all over the place, lots of feedback loops. One of the most important feedback loops is once we know what's going on, we feel we have a new discovery, we've implemented it, we've studied it further, and we follow the babies long term, what else are we learning that then impacts the basic scientists and translational researchers to start to investigate the next problem? Next. Uh, this is just a quick timeline of surfactant therapy. Uh, uh, President Kennedy's baby's already mentioned, but this can take a long time. And one of our goals is to try to shorten this time as much as we can when feasible. Uh, Dr. Avery, um, who is my chief at Boston Children's, but as a resident. And mom. And yours, that's okay. Um, and Jerry Mead, they discovered this surfactant, this type of surface active material was missing in, in preterm babies who died of RDS. Really 1959, 1960. Uh, we mentioned Dr. Uh, President Kennedy's baby. And then there was a lot of translational research. How can we make these compounds? Can we make them? If we do make them, will they improve the lung function in animals, for instance? A lot of research was done in that area. Finally, by the 80s, we were doing large clinical trials of surfactant therapy. And, and, and these we studied uh, literally thousands of babies getting the drug or not getting the drug to see if we could improve the outcomes. And in fact, we did, and in 1990, uh, the FDA approved the first surfactant treatment. Uh, this was, among the things we mentioned, this was probably the one that statistically speaking had one of the largest impacts on outcomes of uh, sick babies. In the very first year after it was approved, uh, there was a 24% decline in uh, premature baby mortality nationwide. Our drug studies alone showed more like a 30, 35% improvement in mortality, but even when you looked at all comers across the country as we implemented this, and this is actually one, I think, where we actually implemented, implemented really quickly. It didn't take us long. Within six months, everybody was using um, surfactant when, uh, when, when need be. We also reduced infant mortality, not just premature baby, but it was a measurable amount of infant mortality. And the early cost savings were thought to be 90 million a year. I think it's much higher than that now. But one of my points also is that uh, research and neonatal intensive care is, is quite cost effective. It's among the most cost effective interventions in medicine. Uh, as we'll see in a minute, not all babies turn out totally well. There's, there are issues and problems, but of our many survivors, uh, again, compared to uh, adults, they live uh, often a full lifespan. And so if we, we have a good outcome as a baby and we get 70, whatever the number is now, 70 odd years of productive life thereafter, uh, it's a very uh, cost-effective treatment that we do. Next. So what about the academic medical centers? We're here to talk a bit about that today, and without totally tooting our own horns, uh, we will a little bit. Um, and we are uniquely prepared for this mission. And, and why is that? Well, we mentioned before that whole spectrum of care, bench, translational research, bedside, follow-up, that loop I showed you a few minutes ago. And uh, we, really, they, we really, as academic medical centers, the place where this all can come together. Uh, most other groups, whether it's a big lab at a university or just a, a hospital with a good intensive care unit, aren't really able to put together that entire package the way that the academic medical centers can. Secondly, it, it takes an army and, um, and support infrastructure. There are literally you know, hundreds of people in our centers that work on these particular projects from many disciplines. It's very multidisciplinary, everything from nursing to pharmacy to uh, you know, scientists, statisticians, and so forth. And Part of the reason I think this is some value to the work the academic medical centers do is that we have these infrastructures in place. We're not having to recreate them from scratch every time. And so when a new project comes along at a place like uh, Children's Where I Work, we're able to actually just ramp up and, and, and do it. Um, I make this sound easier than it is. However, we actually have the infrastructure there to uh, pull these things off. And if we were starting from scratch to say, oh, here's a new research project, Let's hire a bunch of people and a bunch of statisticians and create some labs. It would take a long time and be very, very expensive. We also have a synergy between the research, education, and clinical care. You know, working in an academic medical center where this kind of research is done, it really attracts 
really, we think, the best and brightest and most inquisitive of physicians and, uh, and other researchers. Uh, like I said, it's in our DNA, and it's what we do. And regardless of the funding, we, we seem to find ways of moving the agenda forward. And uh, without the research component, uh, you know, our, our clinical methods don't succeed nearly as well. Further, when you're doing clinical research, there's more eyes on every patient, on every baby. There's, there's other questions being asked in addition to the daily care we're giving. There's a research nurse saying, mm, all this information, pulling things together. So there's many more eyes on every patient and uh, a lot more structure behind it. Finally, uh, the academic, academic medical centers are actually partners with the NIH and other funding agencies on financing the research. Next. So this little graph here, and that's clinical research in the NICU in the beginning, uh, NIH, NICHD up in the upper left corner, uh, a large chunk of the uh, funding comes from them, of course. In the, in the lower left, I have academic medical center internal funding. And I know that at a place like Children's, um, you know, here at, 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 in DC, we focus a lot on all the money that's going out, the you know, billions of dollars funding research. Um, as it ends up, there's a lot of contribution from the medical center themselves. Um, in our institution, it's somewhere around two thirds may get covered, uh, but of the real cost when you add everything up, um, you know, it's, it's not feasible really for the agencies to fund every last dollar and dime. And so the academic medical center is supplied in our area, but about maybe potentially a third of the, of the actual costs. I put sweat, sweat equity at the bottom because uh, there's no dollar sign attached to that, but uh, really, literally hundreds of people spend their time and effort and lives putting this effort out. Uh, philanthropy is great, but it's not sufficient nearly to support the scope of what we're talking about. And then industry is also uh, another partner of ours. I mean, Surfactant's story is actually a, a good one in some ways. It shows the partnerships that happen because a lot of the original discoveries were done through NIH funding in laboratories. The actual clinical trials were funded by pharma, by the uh, drug companies, which is what they can do because they have had a drug at the end to, to sell. But it might not have worked, and so they, they put their own uh, resources at risk as well. And then all the follow through ends up being more back in the academic end as to how we actually fine tune and, and use those preparations. So there's still challenges ahead. Uh, we're slowly improving the survival gap. A lot of the improvement in survival for preemies came between uh, pretty much in the late 70s, 80, and uh, 2000. Although between 2000 and 2008, our estimates show that even in that time, we were getting pretty good, um, but still had a ways to go. We, we still put in interventions that uh, saved a, a nationwide another so seven, 800 lives in that decade of 2000 nationwide. These tiny preterm babies uh, do have a residual developmental issue of some type. Um, fortunately, not often severe, but sometimes so. Um, and a lot of times uh, there's other, um, there are more moderate deficits that uh, we count as, well, we don't, call them, we don't count them as failures, we count them as negatives. In other words, any, any, any deficit a child has when they're finished is not satisfactory for us. Uh, you know, small amount of cerebral palsy where a child has a little bit of stiffness, uh, a learning disability that might not have been there without being a preemie. These are th what we want to attack uh, primarily going forward. Um, but these complex medical issues really take complex answers and, and uh, sufficient funding to do that. And of course, we always live at risk of uh, not being able to sustain the funding that we need to do this level of research. So um, what happens in the long run? One of my favorite studies, actually from, from Canada, is on the uh, quality of life in uh, adolescents. <laughs> I must have animated this. Oh, I did. Good. All right. How about that? Um, so they studied just 150 low birth, or very low birth weight infants under 1,000 gram birth weight. You keep hitting it. And of those, about a fourth had at least one significant developmental problem. And they reported that when they were both studied by their doctors and in their self-reports, yes, I have a limp, I have a learning issue, whatever it might have been. Um, but the important part, in, in my mind, is that when they studied quality of life, in other words, what's, how happy are you, uh, what, what's the value to your life, do you think you're, you know, your health is good, bad, and different, and our psychologists have all sorts of batteries of tests to help really, you know, fine tune this. Well, uh, well I guess there's, the bad news was that there's a bunch of 16 year olds and, and so some of them weren't super happy anyways, but 
those who were preemies were every bit as happy and their quality of life was every bit as good, uh, despite having some objective problems as their, their, their peer group. So um, with, with that, I guess just a brief highlight of how we do it, when, uh, at, at the medical center and what happens. Uh, I want to thank you for your attention and um, remind everybody that you know, you know, the babies that come into our care are really dependent upon uh, you and the uh, NIH for uh, improving their, their lives. Thank you.